So welcome, everybody. Um, I thought it was appropriate to begin this session with a clip, one, because it was done by one of our esteemed panelists, uh, Tiffany Schlein, who's the co-founder of 5050 Day, and made that film. And also because it, to me, really sort of evoked the energy of this movement, this global movement, and also sort of how when we collectively come together and sort of unite with a lot of diversity of voices to really move this conversation forward, this you know, movement towards gender equality, which has never been more important than I feel like it is today. So welcome to Women Leadership in Power, What Will It Take? Uh, I'm Marianne Schnall, and um, What Will It Take? Is, it's partially inspired by a book that I wrote, which was called What Will It Take to Make a Woman President? Conversations about Women Leadership and Power. Um, and the book was inspired by my then uh, eight-year-old daughter, Lotus, in 2008. After Barack Obama was elected president, we were talking about how remarkable it was to have our first African-American president. And she turned to me and she asked, why haven't we ever had a woman president? And it really struck me as this question that was interesting to sort of ponder. And since I am a journalist who's known for interviewing well-known people, um, I set out on this journey to speak to a diversity of thought leaders and political figures and celebrities and artists, artists and activists and writers, really to try to understand not only why we have a woman president, but why don't we have women, you know, in leadership positions in all sectors, you know, in all sectors and industry, women are in less than 20% of leadership positions. And, you know, we're half the population, and we seem to be missing from being seated at the table where all these important decisions are being made. And, you know, the way that I like to frame it is this isn't a women's issue. This is a matter of diversity. This is a matter of having a reflective democracy and having women as part of the conversations that we need in all of these different sectors. And part of the solution that I found was that it, there is a commonality between the challenges and opportunities that um, are preventing women from advancing in women's leadership in all these sectors. And some of them are cultural, they're structural, they're psychological, and we need to be having these conversations together. And that was part of the inspiration for putting together this panel is so that we can begin to have some of these conversations. Um, and I also want to acknowledge that today is International Day of the Girl, which I think is a fantastic day to have this conversation. So um, thank you all for being here, and I am thrilled to have this uh, esteemed panel. I'm just going to read just very quickly, just a little, so you get a glimpse of the, their work, but please feel free to find out more about the work that they do online and to support them, because this is a really terrific panel of change makers. Um, so I guess I'll start. Tiffany Schling, who's on the end, she is an Emmy-nominated filmmaker, artist, founder of the Webby Awards, and co-founder of the International Academy of Digital Arts and Sciences. Her recent film, 5050, Rethinking the Past, Present, and Future of Women in Power, was the centerpiece for the first annual 5050 Day, which had over 11,000 screenings around the globe. They are planning 5050 Day for April 2018, so put that on your calendars. Um, Cynthia Nimmo is the president and CEO of the Women's Funding Network. The Women's Funding Network is an association of over 100 foundations investing in women's equality. And then next is Amy Allison. Amy is president of Democracy in Color, an organization that focuses on race, politics, and the new American majority that worked to elect President Barack Obama, Senator Cory Booker, Senator Kamala Harris, and other leaders who carry a social justice agenda. Her new book about women of color in politics is due out in 2018. And lastly, um, not least, she's a SOCAP old timer. Uh, Suzanne Beagle is a globally recognized private investor and thought leader in gender lens investing. Her consultancy, Catalyst at Large, advises a range of institutional impact investors moving capital with a gender lens. She is all in for women and girls across her own portfolio and is a longtime member and speaker in the SOCAP community. So that um, is a little bit about, bi you know, biographically about um, the work that they do. But the first question that I wanted to talk about, um, this isn't just about getting women in leadership positions. But to me, these days, it's also about how can we empower women to sort of embrace their authentic 
leadership styles and model new paradigms of leadership and power that maybe don't conform to traditional leadership norms. Um, so I thought it'd be interesting to ask each of you to talk just, you know, really briefly, realizing that you've probably all had many, you know, moments along your journey, but can each of you just briefly share a moment that you sort of felt like you embraced your authentic role as a leader? And I guess how that you know connects to the work that you do today. So, um, whoever wants our first, Tiffany. Um, sure. I think uh, as a film director, I made fil I've made films for about 25 years. And the first 10 years of my films, I would have these amazing men narrate. I had Harrison Ford and Peter Coyote and those kind of voice of gods reading my words. And uh, there was a certain point where I was making this film called Connected, and uh, it. It became very, I'm sorry, this mic is like really, sorry. It, it, uh, Excuse me. I was making a film about the history of connectedness from the Big Bang to biology, technology, to where we're going, and what is our desire to connect. And uh, in the middle of it, uh, my father was dying, and I was incredibly close to my dad, and I realized that the story of why we need to be connected all the time is a lot about personal connection, and I was way too intellectual in the film. So I realized I needed to integrate my own personal story, which I had never done in a movie before, and I realized that I needed to narrate half the movie um, because I was telling my story. So it was Peter Coyote and me narrating this movie, and at the end it was so satisfying. I have narrated every movie since. I'm like, why in the hell am I letting men narrate my movies? And there, there are studies that people take more seriously, male narrations. If you watch any trailer or documentaries, it's normally men. But it was the most liberating thing to a uh, be vulnerable in a movie. And now if you watch any of my films, I usually will start with some moment of vulnerability because women are very comfortable with that. It's what connects us with people. And secondly, I narrate the whole movie. And um, that was a real moment of leadership and owning my voice and my perspective and knowing that more women's voices need to be out there. So that, that happened about 10 years ago, but it was a very exciting moment as a, as a filmmaker um, so that's the example I'll give. So thinking of one moment is hard. I'm sure for each one of you, male or female, there are a lot of moments that have led us to the places where we are now. But I'm thinking specifically about when I stepped into this role as the president and CEO of the Women's Funding Network. I had worked at the organization many years ago and had left to do some other things, and I'd come back to be sort of second in command, the COO, which was a really comfortable position for me because I was good at that. And the CEO left, and the board asked me would I be the interim, and I agreed, just to kind of keep it all going because I knew how to do it. So I did that. And they asked me would I also throw my hat in the ring to be the CEO, and I said no. The reason I said no is I had all of the abilities, but capacity-wise it was going to be a stretch for what I had going on for me personally with a young child and other things that I was juggling. So I told them, I will help you find the right person so we can set this up so it can continue to be successful. They continued with their search, and they kept asking me, would I do this? And finally, six months into it, even with the search going on, when they asked me, I thought, OK, so wait a minute. I've been doing this. And at this point, I'm not just keeping it going. This is my vision, 100% of where I want to take this, a 30-year-old organization that's been around for a long time and needs to recalibrate. It's exciting to have that opportunity. So why wouldn't I say yes at that point? And at some point, and this may not be considered a very feminine style of leadership, but we have to take credit for the work we're doing. They were my ideas. It was all my thinking. And a lot of it was really hard. But I loved it. So I said yes. Mm. Yay. Yeah. <laughs> That's very satisfying. Just the last thing I'll say about that is in reflection of all the years I've been in different leadership positions, it is rarely convenient to step into a leadership role. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, democracy and color works to create the society we want through electoral politics, and that means electing new leaders. Uh, after last year's election, I thought really deeply about what that meant for me personally as well as the organization. And I thought about who showed up. And it was black women who 
voted for Hillary Clinton, for example, 97%, who actually have the highest vote turnout of any race and gender in this country. And a, a decades old, I mean, uh, black women have only been able to vote since 65, or their uh, rights have been guaranteed only since 1965, but have this really long history of activism in shaping our democracy. So uh, when a fantastic young leader named Stacey Abrams declared her candidacy for governor of Georgia, a state that uh, had not what Democrat had not won since back in Jimmy Carter's day, a state that's almost majority people of color, and a state that has a, um, a secretary of state that uh, continually removes people off the voter rolls to, to shape the result of the election. When she announced that she was running for governor to be the first black woman governor in the 242 years of our nation's history, I knew that I was being called to do something uh, that I hadn't done before. I thought not only are black women um, dedicated and the leading edge in terms of those who are most willing to stand for democracy, but black women elect women leaders. And so I launched a national campaign called Get In Formation, like Beyonce's Get In Formation. <laughs> I didn't know who'd answer, honestly. I just said, um, this is a national campaign for black women, no matter what state you live in, to get behind Stacey Abrams and help her become the first black woman governor in the history of our country. And we raised and sent her campaign in the first three days, $42,000, just the first three days. Now, to have a black woman elected, she has to spend a lot more, like $20 million, and she would turn the state blue, and she's doing it by empowering young people and people of color, and 60% of the electorate who will vote with her for her in the primary are black women. And so I rose to leadership by calling on fellow black women to rise up into our leadership. And I assumed the coordinating, orchestrating <laughs> role but what I didn't anticipate was that women of all races and men would answer the call to get in formation. Mm. Yes. Oh. Wow. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, like so many of you, I was thinking about the different moments where I stepped into different kinds of leadership. And the story I'll share is about 10 years ago. I had built and sold a business in the ed tech space. I had been moving my own portfolio after that with a gender lens and a social impact lens. I was on the board of a foundation in Los Angeles and rabble rousing, uh, this is back around 2001, 2002, about why we weren't thinking about the investment side of our foundation and we were only paying attention to the grant making side. And I met a group of women philanthropists in 2006 called Women Donors Network. And they were completely focused on philanthropy, as so many philanthropists are. And I said, I don't know much about your world, but I'm really focusing more on the investing side. And they said, please come and join us, and we'll teach you about women and girls philanthropy if you'll teach us about investing. Now, I'm not a shy retiring violet. I went to Wharton Business School. I ran a successful business, which I exited to a multinational. But my investing journey at that point was very personal. I, I wasn't seeing myself as a professional investor. And when they asked me as a group, and they kept sending people over one by one, would you come start this with us? I thought, um, I don't know enough. I'm not an expert. I don't have 20 years in finance. I had some imposter syndrome around this. And I said, you don't really want me to start this. And they said, you're the perfect person to start it um, because you'll come on a journey with us. And you'll, sh you'll share what you know. And I, at that moment in 2007, I said, I'm really excited about stepping into this journey because I can do it in a way which isn't coming from the place of I have 20 years in finance. It's that I've been on this journey. I'm on a path. I may be a few steps ahead of some of you, and I'm going to embrace those of you that are a few steps ahead of me in particular areas. And I was invited. I was encouraged. 
Um, and then I've now spent the last 10 years inviting and encouraging other people to step in in a very similar way, wherever they come from, whatever expertise and different kinds of expertise we bring, um, and not to feel the imposter syndrome, not to feel like I have to know 120% in order for me to say I know enough. Mm. To be okay with the fact that we're all on a journey and to um, learn together, but also to be bold and to challenge each other and to challenge each other to write checks and to back each other and support each other and say, here's the question I've been meaning to ask, but I wasn't sure if I could ask it. So that was so pivotal for me to realize that this was my path. So now, those of you that know me know that everything I do is about gender lens investing. Um, and it really started at that moment to be able to say, I have permission and I am going to step into this. And now I think about Women Donors Network, Women's Funding Network, um, Women Moving Millions, and Confluence Philanthropy and Tonic and all of these places which are men and women investing with a gender lens. Um, when I track back, it was that moment of being invited and encouraged and supported. And I get to do that with people all the time. That's great. Thank you so much, Suzanne. And thank you for everybody for sharing your story. And the thing I'll say that to what Suzanne said is that's what I found in, in my interviews is that the, there, there are psychological barriers a lot of time for women, which is why we really do have to encourage um, and empower women and girls to see themselves as leaders in the first place because there's so many disempowering messages from the media and otherwise that, that tell them otherwise. So I really appreciate you sharing that story. So this next question, which I'm going to ask to everybody, sort of really gets to the heart of you know, why we're here today because right now it really feels like the, the need for women leaders is critical. Um, I feel like you know, we can maybe all agree, it feels like almost like the fate of like our democracy and our country and the world and like, the planet and humanity is at stake. You know, just that. <laughs> um, so, it, but it really does have that sense of urgency. And then you match that with the fact that the progress for women le women's leadership has been painfully slow. Um, and it's, it, in fact, in some cases, regressing. When my, my book first came out, um, the US, United States was 79th in the world in terms of women in national legislature. We are now 104th, so we are literally regressing. And then, and this is according to certain reports, at the current r rate of progress, it will take more than 100 years to achieve gender equality. And I don't know about you, but I don't feel like we've got that kind of time. So, um, so what I wanted to ask with this group, um, you know, what is the, the radical thinking? What are, what are the innovative strategies that we can sort of co-create together that you think will really move the needle to elevate women's leadership? And then, and then also, in the work that you're all doing, what are examples wh that you, where you see things are working or where the sort of new for forms of, of strategies are beginning to emerge? And whoever wants to, to begin, I guess. Um, I can go. I've taken this off because it was really uncomfortable. <laughs> um, that's a form of leadership, knowing if you... <laughs> um, okay, well, I also don't want to wait 100 years. I made this film 50-50 and was looking back all throughout history on how long social change takes. And... Um, couple things. First, quota systems. I know it's very controversial, but I really think they work. Uh, you look at Germany, they were trying to get uh, more people on, w more women on the boards, and guess what? It was just like America, it wasn't happening. And then the government passed that it was a law that 20% of boards had to be women, and guess what? 20% of boards were women. Iceland, just last year, made it a law that women get paid 50, 50 equality in payment, and guess what? Women are getting paid equally. So all of this conversation of, you know, all these groups and research and discussions about how to make this happen at companies is not happening, and I actually think that um, doing, you can call them whatever you want, because I know pledges, you know, you can call them pledges, call them quotas, you can call them whatever you want, but I actually think that companies, um, need to make a stand and say, this is what we're going to do, and we need to all rally behind making that happen. And at 50-50 day this year uh, in April, we're going to encourage companies, schools, and homes to make pledges about equality, because we need men to want this as much as we do. 
Um, it's not called Women's 50-50 Day, it's just called 50-50 Day because it's about equality. And our big goal, and I think it is radical, is engaging um, men in this, not as allies. I actually don't, I, they're like in it with us. Wherever you fall on the spectrum, they need to, they need to know um, why this is so important. I also feel like it's getting kind of biblical these days. Would you agree with what's happening in our world? And I think women are the ones to um, get us out of this in a million <laughs> levels. Um, so I think we need to um, release the data that shows how much better it is when you have more diversity, when you have more women leading. Um, and that is personally, I feel like a lot of that is obviously we need to have more women running, which a lot of them are after Trump. Um, but culture, I really feel like moves that needles forward too. So bringing all that data to life on how important it is to have diversity and to have women leadership and how much better that is for innovation, for the bottom line, and for communities. That was a good sound effect. Yeah. <laughs> so, done. Okay. Should I go? Yeah. Sure. So I don't know that it's so radical. Maybe it's radical to the broader world out there, but maybe not to the group here. Um, one piece is to be seeing the commonality between all of the worlds that we're in. So how do we, being really strategic to say, start with the problems we're aiming to solve, whether that is violence against women, access to sexual and reproductive health, how we're going to handle an aging population and thrive but on the on the sort of social deep social issue side and the and the market opportunity side, start from a strategic place and say, how do we use media? How do we use philanthropy? How do we use the political and legislative tools that we have? How do we use investment um, and bring it together from a really strategic place and coordinate and collaborate? We don't normally get to hang out with each other, but I I feel lucky because I am constantly getting to hang out with people who are coming from these very different worlds. I'm a boundary jumper. I think um, Kathy Clark uh, and I, she coined a term about being a multilingual leader um, a couple of years ago. And I think that resonated so much with me because we need to know each other's worlds um, and support each other. So I am writing checks to African American women leaders. I am using my philanthropy to um, support the social norms change that has to happen in order for the investment that I'm doing to take hold. I am backing media companies. I just invested in my first media company in Africa um, I, because I really want to see, first of all, a woman CEO um, thrive, but also women's voices um, that she's lifting up and amazing men's voices um, who are about um, seeing a 50-50 world. Um, and so it's, it's maybe radical, maybe it's not so radical, it's just to be thinking from a place of empathy, collaboration. Sometimes it's going to also be competitive, um, be OK with the fact that we have to deal with this duality, um, but about the different places that we're coming from and embrace that and say, um, if I don't pay attention to the fact that somebody just passed something on Friday that said that companies don't need to provide access to contraception in their healthcare policy, and I'm investing in access to contraception, um, I'm not going to be successful, you're not going to be, none of us are going to be successful. And these problems, I, I'm so with you, Tiffany, like we do not have time to waste on uh, letting this take 100 years. We, we've got to get strategic and collaborative and um, help each other now. So I would say the other thing, when we're talking about leadership of women or of girls, look in the unexpected places. Because it's not just the woman who's running for office, so that is critical. It's the girls who are in high school, the girls who are finding themselves in the school to prison pipeline. It is immigrants who are here. It's today even the women who are finding themselves lifting up their hands and saying, wait, so we don't have access to birth control anymore? I'm not even sure what, what year this is that we're living in. So a model that's working really well in our world is something called the Young Women's Initiatives that eight of our members have started. These are in eight different states from New York, Minnesota to Tennessee, where they are getting together groups of young women, primarily young women of color, who are experiencing the challenges that we're all talking about wanting to fix. They are not only asking them what the solutions are, they're 
setting themselves, this group up to be advocates. They're connecting them directly to local elected officials, to mayors, to governors who are sitting down with them so that they can inform the policy. These are the people that we're talking about who need to have a voice and who need to be at the decision-making tables. Um, it, it might go without saying. I'm not sure because you're from a bunch of different places. And, uh, um, in the political world, the term minority is defunct. So if you could stop using the term minority, hmm. it would be really radical and helpful to really understand what must happen going forward. In the state that we're at right now, 40% of the population is Latino. The fastest growing population is Asian American. And uh, there's no majority anybody in California or seven states. Two out of every five women in this country are women of color. And under age 18, it's the majority. Mm -hmm. This is our future for women. And I say that to say my radical suggestion, particularly because women of color, I talked about black women, but women of color uh, are more likely uh, by a pretty big margin to vote for uh, a plethora of progressive issues to support candidates. And if we say women, it really covers over which women. It might not make me popular, but I'm biracial, so half of my family's white and half of it's black, so I feel completely fine saying this. <laughs> white women voted for Donald Trump, and as a group of electoral actors in this democracy, 53% uh, of them uh, supported uh, Donald Trump. And compared to a, a statistic like 97% of uh, uh, black women, Latinos and Asian American women, much, much higher than that. Uh, race is the great unfinished business mm -hmm. for women's movement. Yeah. So I, uh, as a biracial person who believes in multiracial and intersectional vision, <laughs> of what our future and our country is going to look like. And in order to be able to have a politics that looks like us, that uh, Women's uh, uh, Donor Network actually measured the number of uh, women who uh, are uh, holding office from the top of the tickets down to local office, as well as women on the ballot, and it's extremely low for women of color. So my radical suggestion is put women of color in the center of your agenda. Put women of color on your leadership teams. Women of color, invite them on the boards. Fund women of color-led intersectional organizations because not only is that group largely the future and the, the core of what um, the set of policies and transformational movement, as, as, uh, by investing in women of color, you're bringing up entire uh, communities and helping to transform democracy. And for the last three years, I've been researching and writing a book that's coming out next year called She the People, uh, The New Politics of Women of Color. And what I found is structurally, there are structural reasons that women of color are so underrepresented in our democracy. And one of them is that women of color are the most primaried group who when they run for office. So this is just a little tidbit before the book comes out. When we do the numbers, we look at uh, uh, most women of color will, will run as, as Democrats. That's a vehicle. I'm not saying it's the best vehicle. I'm just saying a vehicle. And uh, uh, when they run, they're more likely to be challenged by another Democrat in the primary. And when they're challenged, they're more likely for um, people who control the money and control endorsements and control uh, uh, really the buzz about who deserves to be a leader, who looks like a leader, who's believable as a leader, uh, they're more likely to be challenged even in their own party. So structurally, in the, on the political party uh, and also the organizations that surround, fund, support, find candidates, women of color should be all in the mix as an equal sharing partner if you want to win. 
And I think, think look at things like in California, our outgoing um, Senator Barbara Boxer lost white women's vote. I'm not talking about something that's happening somewhere else. I'm talking about California. She lost the white woman's vote and she was reelected the final time based on the strength of women of color. And that's the same story we saw in different states and different regions. So women of color are absolutely critical and essential. And so I just invite us all to figure out how we're going to all come together. That's the radical transformation I think needs to happen now. Well, thanks, everybody. Those are some really radical, great ideas that we should follow up on. Um, and I know we're getting a little tight on time, but I do want to direct a question to each one of you specific to your sectors and just, you know, we'll try to keep answers relatively short. Tiffany, I'm going to just start with you in terms of media, because I think sometimes we uh, don't really fully appreciate the power of the media to shape consciousness and even as like a vehicle for change. And also, you know, women are underrepresented where I think women hold less than 5% of caught positions in the, in the media. And we need more women filmmakers like you and commentators, writers, journalists. We need our voices, our stories, our perspectives, you know, out there. But I wanted to, you know, just you know, succinctly, but how do you view the role of media in terms of its ability to shift culture as well as to shift realities on the ground? Um, okay, I'll say two things, is that I'm making a new film about reflective democracy, so we definitely need to talk. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a short film that's premiering on 5050 Day, and I'm going to work with nine other women film directors of every different background to make one, too, about reflective democracy. So exactly what she was saying. So she just gave this moving, powerful case on why we need our, the people that represent us to be better reflect who we are, right? So what if I could take her words and turn it into a really powerful 30-second commercial or spot? I didn't want to call it a commercial because it's really, I look at these as like releasing the ideas. So she's powerful, but she's one person. So if we can make a short film, that could premiere to millions of people on the same day, how powerful would that be? That's how you really get to move culture. I view these little films as vessels for ideas. So the more that you can do that, I mean, if you look at the great movements that have happened, so much of it began in stories, in films, in documentaries. So, um, you know, as you were speaking, I'm already just thinking about you know, this film I'm working on, which is a lot of what you're talking about. So I think that media, and, and I saw the Gates Foundation just released something for the International Girls Day. Did anyone see that? It's a short little film about uh, girls and energy, and they embedded in it some really startling facts about girls um, being sexually harmed, not being in school, but they embedded it in such an inspiring, powerful short film. In a lot of ways, you can move very heavy ideas around more easily if you embed them in a powerful story or a moving short film. So for me, it's a very exciting way to move ideas to help the people get elected, to kind of move consciousness enough so that when you're in the ballot, when you're about to vote, you've been surrounded with the ideas on why it's important. Okay. Thank you. Um, and Amy, I want to direct this to this next question to you. Um, which is, I feel like right now we can't really afford any divides among women, and yet I think we have to acknowledge there is this bifurcation in the movement of women around race. So, you know, and I don't think we as women have figured that out yet. So, you know, where do you see the opportunities for us to kind of unite to move a common agenda forward in terms of leadership across race? I think that's our, that is our challenge. Um, despite the fact that there's fires burning things up and the White House is in chaos, I actually have a lot of hope and faith that we can uh, come together, but it starts with telling the truth. Um, and um, I would like to see a fundamental shift in what was considered the women's movement, which is a narrow, narrowly defined set of mainly uh, work, um, equal pay, and... Um, uh, you know, abortion rights issues, which are important, necessary, but not sufficient, and just add the term justice onto everything and open up, um, instead of having a women's movement, have a movement of women, and immigra immigrant rights and, and uh, um, uh, Muslim um, uh, human rights and um, uh, the issues of poverty and the issues of gentrification, all are issues that women are... Um, 
intimately um, connected to. And if you go on the ground and you look at organizations who are doing the transformative work in our country, many of them are led by women. They may not be the elected officials, but they are the leaders in articulating and moving our country forward. And really, um, it is women who um, many times are showing up to do the hard work of moving or expanding our democracy and holding a vision of what we could be as a society. Um, so it may seem like just a change of uh, order of words, but a movement of women would give us an opportunity to connect deeply on justice issues, on a broader progressive agenda. And it gives us something to talk about, about who's not um, at the table leading uh, this movement of women, who's not being represented. Because if we make a table, and if you think of your own organizations, if everyone's not at the table, there's actually something wrong. And that for us to be able to tell the truth about building organizations, either private companies or foundations or C3s or C4s or PACs like I run um, or agencies, everyone needs to be at the table that defines where money goes and what the priorities are and who matters. And so uh, one very important way for us to come together as a movement of women is to transform from the inside out the organizations in which you are members, who you fund, who you relate to, and to seek out organizations that are led by diverse sets of women who articulate an intersectional politics, which is, I believe, our future, a very complex, broad range of justice uh, agenda. And that gives us something common that we can talk about. Um, when I say race, is the great unfinished business for women. I mean, let's organize conversations around how to share power in a way that prepares us to win uh, for the future. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Suzanne, um, you're obviously a, a, you know incredible thought leader and you've been working in gender lens investing a long time. Um, for you, what are you seeing in terms of new forms of leadership that's emerging in the investment sphere in venture capital and impact investing? I am so lucky because I'm scanning the field and working with so many of you in this audience and people on the, around the globe and seeing collaborations um, coming forth in the impact investing sphere and the mainstream investing sphere in a remarkable way. Um, so Chris Anderson is sitting here from InFaith. Um, they're building a portfolio around really addressing the root causes of gender-based violence. And instead of just standing and declaring, hey, we're announcing a new fund, they brought together a diverse set of actors from within the investment sphere and within so many different realms to collaborate over the course of a period of time um, to say, how do we do this better? How do we, we're not gonna say that we know exactly how this works. We're, gonna, we're aiming to solve a really intractable problem and we're gonna need a lot of different kinds of intelligence and expertise. That's one example. On Friday, I was lucky enough to be part of a collaboration that I've helped bring forward on access to sexual and reproductive health in the United States. And there's a, another one that's launching around Latin America. But this, again, is bringing together a really disparate set of funders, policy people, investors, to say how do we collaborate to first understand the basis of what we're really trying to solve for um, and have diverse voices in that room. And then let's say, where can philanthropy be best used? Where do we need to work legislatively? Where we need to be um, applying investment or blended capital? So that collaboration was led by a very bold woman leader. It's got men and women coming together to say, this, these are not women's issues, but how do we collaborate to form a funder investor collaborative so instead of I'm gonna to get to this deal first and I'm gonna make a killing here first. It's how do we do this well together and how do we learn? Um, there's a, a, another friend of mine who's launched something called SheEO. How many of you have heard of this or part of it? Um, this is about really turning venture capital on its head and saying let's have a thousand women contribute a thousand dollars each into a pot, but every single person is an activator, and we nominate together 
the ventures that are going to get investment. And every single venture that gets invested in gets to say what they need on a regular basis, not just once. And every single person who puts their money into this fund can, commits to being an activator and to collaborate with each other to support each one of those ventures. And so it's, and it's got a different set of dynamics and expectation and invitation um, to say maybe not all venture capital needs to look the same. And maybe we need a different set of people who get to be at the table. It's not to say, I mean, Vicky is quite radical. She will say the whole system is broken and um, uh, she would just as soon get rid of a significant part of the venture capital uh, space. I am embracing the diversity, the incredible diversity of these different flavors of capital. And so um, I'm just, we're just about to publish a study at Wharton Business School, Wharton Social Impact Initiative, of 58 funds that are investing with a gender lens across the world with different kinds of lenses. And when I asked each fund manager, are you up for collaborating? I know you're all competing for capital, but are you up for collaborating and co-investing with each other and making what you're doing visible? Um, and uh, we'll create a safe space for that conversation about how are we doing this? Everybody was up for it. Um, but it's the power of the invitation and the power of it's kind of creating a safe space and saying, I'm going to celebrate the fact that you're raising a fund and I'm raising a fund um, and that we might be going after the same deal, but to do this in a different way. And so I, I could give you 50 different examples from within the SOCAP community um, where I'm seeing really remarkable new forms of leadership and collaboration, again, from women, extraordinary women, and also extraordinary men UN uh, coined this phrase, he for she's, and I go around and a lot of you might see me hugging men and women at the conference and saying, you're one of the he for she's that I really love being in partnership with. Um, and I just think that's also part of the picture is how are we embracing women's leadership, but also how are we embracing men's leadership in this as well? Absolutely, I 100% agree with that. And men want to be part of this conversation. We have to, you know, allow them and invite them in. Cynthia, um, just quickly to, to get to you in terms of, you know, you work in philanthropy, which really spans across all sectors. So what do you think, what is the bold thing that you think needs to happen to fund and support the types of leadership that we've been discussing here today? We have to redefine what success looks like. So that when the philanthropy, the funding, is going toward more women in the media, more women running for office, any of the things that you're hearing about, equal pay, reducing violence against women, which even in the U.S. affects one in three women in her lifetime, it's going to look different than maybe the tr traditional funding landscape that many of you in the room are used to if you're here as investors. Okay, so what that means is to really have the solutions that we need. We're changing people's minds. We're changing how they think and how they behave. It's hard work. It takes a long time and it costs a lot of money. That's why we have philanthropy. And in my world, it's why we have women's philanthropy. There are many, many women who are either giving and we have organizations like Women Moving Millions, which are about women who are giving at least one million or more for gender equality, where we have women's foundations, which are part of our network, where these women are putting 100% of their foundation's assets towards gender equality. So how do you measure that kind of change? It is not as straightforward as taking an issue like the fact that in the world, 62 million adolescent girls are not in school. And yet, education is a critical strategy to breaking cycles of poverty. So, you can build the schools, and that's important. We need those. If you're in a country or an area where girls may not be able to go to the school because the walk to school is dangerous, they could be raped, they could be abducted, anything could happen, or they can't go to school because they're menstruating, and that's not a thing you do. You don't leave your home if that's happening, or you don't have supplies. Or you can't go to school because your number one role in your family, no matter what your age is, if you're a girl, is to make money to find a way to care for the family. So how are you going to get that girl to school? 
you need to fund the organizations that are going to those locations and working to make these shifts in culture and behavior, redefining what it means to be involved, to have a voice, and to show up in places like that. This work is happening around the world. There are many bright spots. You just have to open your eyes and look for them. It's not as straightforward as a lot of investors would like. It may not be about the number of people who showed up every day, but it's everything about who's being asked for a solution and are the communities who are experiencing it part of creating a new way. So another example in the state of Mississippi, which for a long time was in the US, had the second highest rate of teen pregnancy, which there are a lot of challenges that that raises. One of them is how much that costs the state as far as economic power. A third of teen moms will not go on to get her high school diploma. So the Women's Foundation of Mississippi spent time talking to girls and boys, teenagers, to find out what might they need. Now, this is a state where sex, sexuality education is abstinence only. So what was actually needed was medically accurate information about how your body works in a safe place where teens could access it. So it took a lot of time to do that in a place that was not so receptive to having those kinds of conversations. And what they ended up creating was a website called factnotfiction.com. It's fantastic. It's for teens, male and female, to be able to go online, ask questions, get information, and be prepared so they can make decisions that are right for them. It was so successful that beyond the state of Mississippi, it's being accessed throughout the US and in other countries because the need was so great and because teens were involved in saying, here's what's needed. They are drastically reducing the rates of unplanned teen pregnancy. It's just one example. It's important to have this kind of funding that we think, or I think in this world, people consider radical. It's not in the world of women's funding. It's how we do our work, and it's how we make our impact. Well, thank you so much. And I know it looks like that we've run out of time. Um, and I hope that I know we didn't have time for questions that you can feel free to come up to us and ask us if you do have questions. Um, and I hope follow up on all the incredible work that everybody on this panel does and, and the types of organizations that they mentioned. I also wanted to let you know that I am launching a platform called What Will It Take Movements to Ignite and Empower a New Generation of Women Leaders, which will we hope to continue to have events and panels just like this um, and to be sort of a connective tissue to uplift all the voices and organizations that are working to advance women's leadership. So I would love it if you would, if you were interested, go to whatwillittake.com and sign up to our mailing list to find out about more conversations like these, as well as to please share what you're interested in, what type of resources you'd like to see, and about your work so that we can help spread the word. So I would like to thank this incredible panel um, for all of their insights and you know to all of you for, for coming. So thank you so much. Thank you.